Thank you all for coming. And uh, uh, let's see if I can get organized here. Cancer is something that's a challenge for everyone in this room. I'm sure all of you know someone or have had an experience with cancer yourself uh, or with relatives, friends, coworkers. And it's why it's such a challenge is a challenge in itself. So we're going to talk and think today. I want to have a conversation with you about why cancer is so hard to treat. What is it about cancer specifically that really, um, oopsie, uh, uh, challenges medicine, challenges people, challenges the field of nutrition, exercise, lifestyle, uh, everything is, uh, it's kind of uh, stymied by cancer. So let's start with some cases. You all know of this gentleman when he was 25. He was diagnosed with metastatic cancer. And it was a serious situation. He had testicular cancer that had spread to the brain, uh, to the lungs. And he survived. And he received the usual standard treatment. And that's given as a maximum tolerated dose, meaning that chemotherapy is given in amounts high enough to just barely not kill the patient, but hopefully kill all of the cancer cells so that the cancer is gone and the patient's still with us. That's the goal. Surgery is often unnecessary in um, uh, testicular cancer except for removal of the affected testicle, but the metastases do not need to be removed surgically. And in his case, uh, that was uh, successful. So what was it about his cancer? There was something about his cancer in particular that was amenable to this approach. Not all cancers are amenable to this approach, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So pediatric cancers, cancers of reproductive cells, so the placenta, the ovary, uh, the ova themselves, the sperm themselves, these are germ cell tumors, or the, the cells ma that make these, tumor, uh, make these cells. Um, choriocarcinoma is a disease of uh, pregnancy um, and a problem with uh, either the pregnancy itself or the placenta. Um, certain types of immune cells can become cancerous, and those are often easy to treat, relatively easy to treat and cure with chemotherapy. Um, lymphomas, same idea. Tumors of ma the mature adult, the tumors that you're all familiar with, colon cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, lung cancer, those are a different animal. And I use the word animal on purpose. We're going to talk a little bit about the evolution of cancer, both in the entire uh, geobiologic time frame and within a single person. But the tumors of early adulthood can't be cured unless they can be removed surgically and or treated very carefully and vigorously with um, chemotherapy and possibly some combination of chemotherapy, surgery, and radiation. And that's only if they're in the earliest stages. So that's a problem because 40% of cancer patients don't have one of these curable cancers like Lance Armstrong did. Um, uh, they have something in this list. And uh, so metastatic carcinomas, that includes the common ones that you've heard of, breast, pancreatic, lung, prostate, um, colon, sarcomas, uh, melanomas, chronic leukemias, even though those are immune cells uh, forming the tumor, uh, because they're uh, slow growing, they're paradoxically not curable, same for chronic lymphomas. So let's take another case. This is a 62-year-old man with prostate cancer and a PSA that's off the charts. My laboratory at my hospital can only read PSAs up to 1,500, so if, if your PSA is more than that, it just says more than 1,500. This is his bone scan. You can see all those black spots. Those are metastases involving the bone. So there are prostate cells in his bones trying to make uh, spermatic fluid, those kinds of things. That's what prostate cells do, but they don't belong in the bone. They belong in the prostate, so this man is sick. So we treat him with maximum dosage of the treatments that we have for prostate cancer. And uh, we treat him constantly, and we treat him with as big a doses as we can. In prostate cancer, the current treatment, the treatment du jour, is called androgen deprivation therapy. Androgens, of course, being male hormones. 
So we deprive the prostate cancer cells of male hormones in various ways, and the uh, uh, patient gets better. The PSA is two. The scan looks much, much better. The relatives are ecstatic. Hey, the treatment's working. And uh, the patient is a usually a little more guarded, like, hmm, wow, is this, you know, can this really be true? This sounds a little too good to be true, but they're, they're, they're happy. But what happens? What always happens? What happens every single time? The treatment stops working. Why is this? It's not just prostate cancer. This is a patient with metastatic breast cancer. Uh, all of those black spots are tumors from the breast that have spread to other parts of her body. Uh, and if she's treated with the maximum tolerated dose of uh, the anti-breast cancer drugs, which are different than the anti-prostate cancer drugs, she will get better for a while. And the scans will look better for a while. Then the disease will come back or it was never gone, but it will roar back, look like this again, and the patient will succumb. So, so why is that? And the answer is uh, partly contained, I think, in our popular culture. Who has seen The Lion King? Okay, I, um, I'm gonna tell you all about this movie, and I have to tell you first that I haven't seen it, okay? So don't judge me. Um, I will, I, hopefully I can go see it this weekend, but I haven't seen the previous version either. But The Lion King from the previews, it's a, um, and don't spoil it for me, those of you who've seen it, okay, no spoilers. It's a coming of age story. And uh, uh, the baby lion, the lion cub, has to become the, lion, the next Lion King. And how does he do that? He overcomes obstacles, and it sounds like the obstacles are gonna be pretty darn tough. All right, so I think that's what the movie's gonna be about. And that is what cancer is about. It's about overcoming obstacles. Cancer has a lot of obstacles to overcome before it can get a foothold in your body. So your job and my job as the oncologist is to make sure that it doesn't get a chance to overcome those obstacles. The other thing, though, that I think is a little more subtle is, well, the, back to the movie. Okay, I, I don't want to, this cancer's depressing. Let's, let's talk about the movie for a second. Um, the Lion King, this cub has to become, he's not becoming the lion prince or the lion, I don't know, um, you know, uh, burger flipper, okay? He's becoming the lion king. So that means he has to overcome kingly obstacles. So Walt Disney or whoever's running this movie, starting this movie is going to put big obstacles in front of him. That's something that we are just starting to understand about cancer. Maybe we don't want to put big obstacles in front of a cancer we can't cure. So I'll let you think about that for a second. And let's take a little detour down history um, and talk about why cancer even exists in our biosphere. Why is there cancer? What a horrible thing. So cancer is a result of evolution. And evolution is about the, only the strongest survive, right? How many think only the strongest survive? Evolution. Oh, you guys are too smart. Okay. So, oopsie. Oh, well, you saw the punchline. Okay, so uh, this guy is probably stronger than that camel. Um, but only in a certain context. You put him in the desert, this poor guy survived, by the way. This was a heat wave in a zoo in Argentina, and they dumped ice on him for two weeks until the heat wave passed, and he made it. But in any case, uh, you can see that he's not in any mood to reproduce here. He's uh, in the, uh, honey, I've got a headache tonight mood, um, and nothing much is going to happen uh, in this survival mode. So it's not survival of the strongest. It's survival of the fittest. And by fit, we're not talking about strength. We're talking about fit. How well do you fit in your environment? How well does your environment fit you in terms of making it easy for you to reproduce? So of course a camel has to be in the desert and a polar bear has to be in the Arctic and uh, that's where they reproduce best. Um, switch places and nothing good is going to happen in terms of reproduction. So evolution is about who gets to reproduce. Fitness is about who gets to reproduce. Um, cancer is about 
who gets to reproduce on the cellular level. So cancer has been around for a long time, and I'm going to give you a, a hint. Cancer arose when single cellular organisms decided to band together and not be single anymore and form multicellular creatures. Cancer is not a disease of modernity. Cancer has been uh, plaguing all sorts of creatures long before pollution, of the current modern type anyway. Um, an Egyptian mummy with uh, breast cancer has been found. And uh, not to pick on the Egyptians, this is a mummy, uh, this is uh, the remains of a hip bone from uh, uh, someone in Siberia uh, with metastatic cancer thousands of years ago. So if cancer is one of the trade-offs for being a multicellular creature, um, why would that even happen? Well, because being multicellular increases your ability to reproduce. So if you're a single-celled spheroid creature, if you become really large, your surface area doesn't go up proportionally, and your surface area is how you take in food. So if you're a uh, single-celled creature, you have to in, um, soak food in through your, through your cell uh, wall or membrane, um, and there's less of it proportionally the larger you get. But if you have lots and lots of different cells, um, the surface area can be maintained. And indeed, in your intestine, as you know, um, I forget how big it is, but it's something like several tennis courts if we actually flattened out the surface area. Uh, so you can take in a lot of food. And as the previous speaker uh, pointed out, uh, that's both good and bad. Um, multicellular creatures can live longer because they have a division of, of labor. So we can... Um, uh, live a long time, many decades, a, a protozoan or a single-celled creature might just live a few minutes, uh, maybe a few days, uh, but they're in a sense immortal in that when they divide, um, there are two of them. There's no death with that. And let me let, me let you think, uh, think about that for a minute too. So a single-celled organism has to have an awfully good reason to agree to align itself with other single cells and live that way. So alignment of fitness is what evolutionists call this, and it occurs at the moment of fertilization. So when the sperm fertilizes the egg and the zygote is formed at that moment, the fertilized egg, at that one moment, you've all been there, you were just one cell, that only lasted for maybe less than an hour before you divided and became two and we were on our way to multicellularity, or you were. Um, but in that moment, you were aligned with one goal, the goal of that zygote. And I'm talking biologically, I'm not talking philosophically or uh, spiritually or anything like that. But the goal of that zygote is to mature and get its DNA to the next generation. That's it. All of the rest is expendable, okay? So that DNA has to be present in every single cell in that multicellular organism. That way they're all aligned, we all have the same DNA, we all want to get that DNA to the next generation. To, once they're aligned, then they can agree to adhere, they have to stick together, you don't have part of you here and part of you over there. Um, you're all stuck together. Um, uh, these cells have to communicate, they have to cooperate, um, and they have to specialize. You can't all do the same thing. I mean, I guess there was that movie, The Blob, where the thing rolled around and everybody did the same thing in that, in that giant mass of cells. But um, for you, you have different parts. And uh, uh, the goal, again, is the uh, uh, transfer of the genetic material to the next generation, and that is called the export of fitness. So there's a terrible price to be paid or being a multicellular creature. And that is that almost all of you, I don't mean all of, I, I, can I pick on you? I'm gonna pick on you right here, <laughs> okay. Almost all of you is going to die, but if you have kids, a couple, of, you know, one or two sperm, or three or four, I don't know, how, do you have any kids? Yeah, okay, so, so two sperm are going into the next generation. Bye-bye, they're, they're off, you've exported your fitness. But the rest of you, not so lucky, the rest of you has made a pact with those uh, sperm cells, in your case, um, uh, that we will die and we will support you with all we've got until we die so that you can export 
our genetic material to the next generation. It's a pretty heavy pact. So uh, um, it's kind of interesting. When you do something like that, you're kind of putting uh, uh, all your eggs in one basket, literally the ovary, all right? And, uh, and then you watch that basket. So the purpose of a multicellular creature is to carry its genetic material, sperm or egg, to the next generation and be really careful until that happens. After that's done, there's no evolutionary pressure to prevent death. That's why cancer occurs mostly in older people. You can't select for something that happens after, you can't select evolutionarily or fitness-wise for something that happens after reproduction. So we talked about how uh, multicellular organisms are, cre are composed of cells that have to cooperate uh, in the, for the one single purpose of uh, advancing the genetic material to the next generation. Well, you were once a single cell. That single cell and all of your cells that are descended from that have a memory in them of their days swimming in the Paleozoic Ocean I'm sure I'm getting the geologic age wrong, but in ancient seas as single-celled, freewheeling organisms that didn't have to worry about anybody else. They remember that. All those genes are still in there. They're layered on top of, uh, on top of those are layered new genes that uh, make you human. But those old genes can be covered up. And one way to think about this is that they can also be uncovered and make it back into the world. And that happens with aging. There are fences or barriers to uh, uh, access to those old programs, uh, but uh, uh, those can be worn away with age. So that's one way to think about that. And the reversion to individualistic behavior, lack of cooperation, loss of cooperation, can result in one of two things. Cell suicide, there are suicide programs that will kill a cell a cell will kill itself if it's starting to uh, wobble in its commitment to the entire organism. The other thing is if that suicide program is also damaged, um, cancer can form. The cell loses its ability to cooperate with the rest of the organism. It goes for itself. It likes to divide because that's what single-celled organisms do, um, and you have a cancer. So again, um, larger body size gives you a larger number of cells in which this can happen. So there's just a stochastic or statistical risk with being large. Um, there's also a risk, as the previous speaker pointed out, with uh, bigger body size within a species. So, uh, and that's mediated by things like IGF-1. If you have a large animal in a species and a small animal in a species, the larger one will be at greater risk for cancer, and that includes humans. So a good example is Great Danes. Very high risk of cancer. Most of them have cancer by the time they're five, six, seven years of age and they die of it. Um, whereas chihuahuas can live to be 17 or 18. They do get cancer, but they get it much later and they don't get it as much as Great Danes do. And that's because Great Danes and large dogs in general um, have more IGF activity. They may not have actually more IGF, but they have more IGF activity. That increases the risk of cancer. Um, and of course, the longer you live, uh, the greater the risk of cancer. So cancer is seen again in all, all sorts of creatures um, that are multicellular. This is a hydra on the right, is an abnormal hydra with a funny bump on its side. It's got a tumor. Mushrooms, fungi, if they're multicellular, can uh, develop tumors. Even though we use them to treat cancer, they can develop cancer themselves. This is a mushroom with a tumor. And you can see it's a fairly well-developed tumor. There's a, uh, it's trying to grow a second cap. Uh, up on top there, you can see the gills in the, in the tumor. And here's a cactus, a saguaro cactus with a tumor on top. So let's talk about cancer developing in one organism. We've just kind of taken a look at cancer in the entire uh, biosphere. Let's look at it inside one creature. So a cancer needs an ecosystem. If you have a cancer, you are the cancer's ecosystem. So you want to make your ecosystem very inhospitable. So dinosaurs like warm climates. When the KT event occurred uh, and the asteroid hit the Earth, 
a lot of the dinosaurs were killed by the blast and the, the tsunamis and those kinds of things, but most of them died out over the next uh, many, many uh, thousands of years from uh, a type of nuclear winter, if you will, a big cloud cover that cooled the earth and made it very cold, and dinosaurs didn't do well. Mammals, which were warm-blooded, then became ascendant because they could regulate their temperature. The guinea hen was a fowl in North America that went extinct from uh, many small insults. Uh, uh, it was hunted. Uh, there was a big blast of hunting because they were, uh, I don't know, I guess they were there. Maybe they were good to eat. I don't know. Um, and then uh, there was a little guinea hen conservation effort in the northeast. Uh, and uh, some farm had something like several thousand guinea hens. And uh, uh, then there was a, a guinea hen flu. A lot of the birds died of some epidemic in this farm. And then they had a few left. They had something like 200 left. Kept those around for a while and tried to rehabilitate the population. But the barn burned down. And that was the end of the guinea pigs. So there was this big bang, you know, everybody hunting them, lowering the population. And then the population became unstable and vulnerable because there weren't quite enough to sustain it. And so further insults such as the guinea hen flu and then the barn burning finished off this species. The boll weevil is a pest of cotton crops which destroyed much of the economic value of the southern cotton crop in the United States in the early part of the 1900s. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And then cancer is a condition that takes place in an ecosystem which is an individual, an individual organism. So what do ecosystems provide? For cancers and for every, everything else that lives in an ecosystem, they provide uh, all the things that you need to be able to mature and then ultimately reproduce, which is, again is the goal. Um, and they also contain some challenges. So um, let's look at the, the uh, cancer ecosystem in the human body. So a cancer needs fuel, um, and cancers can use uh, fats and proteins and nucleic acids and other things as well as glucose. Many cancers prefer glucose, but it does not mean that they can't use these other fuels. Um, so when you c use the ketogenic diet, you want to combine it with some other treatment that combines insults, sort of uh, in the guinea hen uh, extinction uh, paradigm. Uh, just doing something by itself is unlikely to be, uh, uh, with food, is unlikely to be completely successful. Um, space. A cancer does better in a kind of an open space in many, uh, many times, in, an, in a relaxed tissue. A cancer can have predators, okay? The immune system, the oncologist, coming to get, get you, okay? It needs transportation, uh, it needs a supply chain for its nutrients, and it needs waste removal. Um, uh, climate, in a sense, uh, that's a bit of a stretch, but pH, uh, toxins, um, uh, uh, you know, heat and cold, all of those things can affect the growth of a cancer, and they're different in different parts of the body. So you've noticed that uh, certain cancers, you may have noticed that certain cancers have a propensity to grow in certain organs. So uh, for instance, hormone receptor positive breast cancer tends to grow in the bones. Well, it, has, it likes calcium. Milk is made out of calcium. These are cells that are trying to make milk, so they go where the calcium is. Um, uh, colon cancers like to spread to the liver. Um, the liver is kind of a nice place. It's directly uh, in the transport line. It's the next bus stop in terms of blood flow from the intestines to uh, the liver. There's just one stop there through the portal veins. And uh, the liver is full of glycogen and also fat in many cases. And there's a lot of food there, a lot of blood flow. Um, and you get the picture. So, uh, uh, and then there are competitors uh, in an ecosystem. So again, fitness is about fit. So a cancer has to fit into its ecosystem. And in the early phases of a cancer, a cancer is often not extremely aggressive. It's kind of more like a farmer. And I don't mean this in a good way, like a farmer is a person who, you know, produces food and value for, uh, you know, a community. This is not what we're talking about. I'm just talking about how a cancer uh, situates itself where it finds itself and how it makes um, use of the resources that uh, it has access to. So uh, farmers are really good, human farmers are really good at uh, adapting 
the landscape to fit their needs. They can um, create irrigation, uh, they can rotate crops, they can uh, till the soil if necessary, all sorts of things. Um, and uh, as long as a farmer is able to do these things, the farmer is going to do what they do, which is farm. Same with cancer cells. So a cancer might be there. How dangerous is it in the earliest stages? Well, this is something that we're just starting to think about in some new ways. Um, should we get all excited and, I don't know, uh, cut off its blood supply? Um, that may not be an appropriate response. What happens when you cut off uh, blood supply? Uh, then the farmers may start to, to starve if you cut off their irrigation system. The crops don't grow, they can't eat. They may become unhappy, they will respond. So all living creatures, including cancer cells, respond to perturbations in their environment and they try to maintain or re re uh, return to a kind of homeostatic mechanism. Um, so uh, they will change themselves to fit the environment or they will change the environment. If they can't do that, they'll leave. That's called metastasis in cancer. We don't want that. Um, if we dump a lot of chemo on this uh, early cancer, that might happen. They might leave. Um, they also can produce a lot of acid and invade the neighbors. Just move in next door. Of course, that's not good for the neighbors. They might get on the highway and drive to a different organ and take up there. But if you perturb a cancer too much, you will make it more aggressive. And that's what we saw in our first two cases. So the boll weevil. After World War II, the boll weevil was treated with DDT. And uh, from 1950 to 1958, that worked, and then it stopped working. Does that sound familiar? And now, ecologists and oncologists are starting to talk to each other because we're both dealing with the same problem, which is pest management. So again, an organism responds to perturbations in its environment by doing something. What you don't want a cancer to do is get worse and leave. So how can we do pest management in human cancer? This is a prostate that's been sectioned the yellow part on the right side of the screen is the tumor. This is the metastasis. We've seen this fellow. The purple cells are treatment sensitive. This is a tumor, okay? Uh, there's one treatment resistant cell in this tumor. If we remove all the treatment sensitive cells, the patient's scans look better, but what have we really gotten? We have a tumor that now is smaller, but you see that there's more green or resistant cells. Does that make sense? What happens if we keep doing that? Well, basically, to make a long story short, we end up with all green cells. The whole situation's worse than at the beginning, and the patient's going to die. And that's what always happens with androgen deprivation therapy for metastatic prostate cancer. Always. So why do we do that? We make cancers resistant. Well, we're, we're not doing that anymore. We're, we're, we're trying to get away from that. But um, uh, what, are there other things that we could do, other treatment paradigms? And the answer is yes. Somebody's holding up a five-minute sign, so I better get on with it here. Um, we can give a lower dose, and we can give the doses less frequently. And then what happens is that you see here, we have fewer purple cells. Um, there's only one green cell here. Oopsie. Um, and then we, we don't treat again. You notice in the second... Uh, arrow going to the right, uh, there's a no treatment over it. We let the purple cells recover. Anyway, you get the idea here. We try to give as little treatment as we can so that we can keep treating. Does this work in real life? It's a nice idea. It does. Two cohorts of uh, men with prostate cancer, 11 patients received this type of treatment called adaptive therapy, low dose, intermittent. Uh, and uh, 16 patients received the usual uh, standard constant uh, therapy. To make a long story short, uh, 10 of the 11 patients in the experimental group uh, did well uh, and were still uh, stable at 24 months. 
whereas 14 of the 16 patients uh, were worse at 14 months. And not only that, much less drug, meaning fewer side effects, was the result uh, for the patients who did better. So how about the patient with metastatic breast cancer? So I'm going to tell you about a case report of a patient with uh, triple negative, the worst kind of breast cancer, hard to treat, metastases to lung, liver, and bone, not an early stage. 15 years later, at 72, she's alive and well, has a good quality of life, she's off treatment and has no signs of this cancer. How did this happen? They gave her a big blast of treatment up front, and then they followed it with a, an entire year of weekly treatments, and they rotated the treatments over uh, every two to three months. So she was never kept on the same treatment more than two or three months. In other words, they didn't wait until the tumor got worse on the scans to change the treatment. So I call this extinction therapy. This is kind of the uh, KT event for a cancer. You blast the heck out of it at the very beginning, and then you keep the pressure on with a nuclear winter over the next few years. So when, um, uh, and these are the details. If anybody wants those, you can have the slides afterwards. But let me just uh, summarize here. So there are three ways to treat cancer. You can apply curative therapy, but you'd better make sure that you have a type of cancer that will respond to curative therapy by being cured. If you give a maximum tolerated dose of cancer therapy to a cancer that can't be cured, you may make things worse. These are the cancers that can be approached with maximum tolerated dose and should be. Pediatric cancers, cancers that arise in the reproductive cells, certain immune cell cancers, um, and then curative therapy can be applied usually with surgery and radiation and also a combination of chemotherapy or any, any combination of those uh, in early stage cancers of maturity. Um, extinction therapy, this is for those cancers that you think you might be able to cure, uh, that usually aren't cured. If you were going to try to cure them, how would you do it? You'd blast them up front and then keep the pressure on constantly for at least a year. At least that's what worked in that case that I showed you. And then there's adaptive therapy, which means you coexist with the cancer. You give up trying to cure the cancer. Does that mean you just don't treat it? No. I mean, this picture is supposed to be kind of silly, okay? Um, that's not really realistic. You keep the tumor sensitive to treatment by treating it very, very gently. You try not to turn it into a marauder. So you use the lowest necessary dose. You dose very infrequently, and uh, you do that based on the tumor growth, not a calendar or an oncologist's schedule or guess. And the goal is to weaken the nasty parts of the tumor uh, and strengthen the host's ability to resist that tumor. Um, and uh, thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'll take those. So we have about five minutes for questions. So if someone to come up and ask a question, we have five minutes for, for questions. So I, I've heard an idea um, about, uh, you know, prophylactically trying to uh, minimize the risk for cancer of, of fasting, you know, for extended periods of time with the idea that uh, it can, you know, kill off uh, cancer cells. And so when, as you're giving your talk, it occurred to me that would that strategy possibly perturb, you, you know, perturb uh, something that uh, you know, has the potential to grow and actually have the opposite effect potentially? So we do see that sometimes in advanced cancer. So we see um, uh, people doing a lot of fasting. Eventually the cancer itself may become resistant to fasting because, again, cancer does respond to its environment. But animal studies are very, very clear. Um, to fast before a cancer appears appears to be very, very salutary. It appears to be one of the very few things that can actually not prevent cancer, but delay its onset. So you still, I think I really want to say this, uh, I want this to be understood. Fasting does not prevent cancer, it delays it. That's good, because hopefully you will die of 
you know, something else at 120 before you ever get cancer. But fasting is effective in delaying the diseases of aging, including cancer. Yes. <laughs> I've been down. Um, fantastic talk. Um, I really love your work, Dawn. Um, could you give us an idea as to why there's this prevailing misconception around uh, a ketogenic dietary appro approach and sugar and carbohydrates being the only villain in the root cause of cancer and cancer proliferation. Uh, what are your thoughts on that when the evidence obviously suggests that isn't, certainly isn't the case? So I think that, um, you know, that's a really great question. And the reason is, is that uh, some of the early work with uh, ketogenic diet, any dietary perturbation is going to be effective in the beginning. So when you uh, uh, do something to perturb the landscape for the farmers, uh, uh, it's going to be very effective. It doesn't matter whether you burn the crops or you cut off the irrigation or you introduce a pest, um, uh, you know, or, or you send someone to steal all the, the, the uh, produce. Uh, but, but... The system will respond. The farmers will figure out a way around each one of those problems. Um, and I think that's what we've, you know, that's just what we're seeing. We, we looked at things uh, and saw this nice response and uh, our hope was, oh wow, you know, this is, this is it. Um, but it, it turns out not to be it. That it does give a clue. So if you just do one of those things to the farm, you steal the crops or burn, burn the fields or cut off the water supply, you're probably, you know, not going to permanently uh, remove that farmer from, from business. They're going to respond. But if you do all of those things, or as many of those as you can all at once, you have a much higher likelihood of getting rid of that farm and farmer. So that's kind of the paradigm that I think right now we need to work with with cancer, um, and that's to, to come at it with several different approaches at once. You don't want a serial approach, you know, first I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to cut off their water supply, and then I'm going to burn. You don't want to do it that way. You want to uh, do it all at once. The other thing you want to do is make sure that when you are treating a cancer, you strategize. So if, you're, if you decide, okay, I'm going to burn down this field. Well, you know, I'm going to do a couple of things. Are you going to uh, 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 burn down the field and uh, then cut off the water supply? No. First you cut off the water supply, then you burn down the field. Well, there are ways of sequencing cancer treatments that make the same sort of sense, so that when you apply a second treatment, the first treatment has already prepared the way and made it much more difficult for that cancer to recover from the second treatment that you're going to apply. So um, I think that uh, we as human beings tend to get really excited, and we should, about any inroads that we can make with cancer, and I think that the work with the ketogenic diet is fantastic. I use the ketogenic diet a lot, and I use fasting a lot with my cancer patients during treatment, um, but I do caution them that that's not something that's probably going to work all by itself. In the same way, just chemotherapy is unlikely to work all by itself. You want to combine these things. So I, ho I hope that answers your question um, uh, somewhat. Um. Thanks, Don. Excellent, as, as usual. Uh, my, my question is kind of like a follow-on from Daryl's. I think as me and him and some others in this room, we're probably approaching the Great Danes of the human species, so maybe we're... <laughs> we're we're, we're a bit more worried about this, and there's, there's certainly uh, some talk about overall minimizing total growth factors, total like TOR uh, activation uh, to try and minimize cancer growth. And I just wondered about your, your, your thoughts on that, because you know, we may want to think about balancing cancer versus uh, risk of sar sarcopenia and falling over, breaking a hip, and dying in hospital of, of pneumonia. And so do you have any, any, any thoughts on how, how those of us um, who are worried about that might think about that? So there, there are always trade-offs. So, um, you know, the more growth hormone you have, the bigger you are, the more likely you are to reproduce, okay? Women like large men, apparently, human women, okay? And they would be more likely to choose you. So um, that's a trade-off. Uh, there are also trade-offs at different parts of the lifespan. So in old age, having too low of an IGF-1 is a risk factor for death um, because you get the sarcopenia, the osteoporosis, the Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, those kinds of things. You need the, some growth hormones to keep things juicy and, and um, strong in old age. So there's very much a knife edge. And I think that the way to do it and the way that I like to look at it and the way I, the way I try to do it um, when I'm not eating pound cake, which I did have some last night, it was delicious, but um, that's rare, but um, is to make sure that you are 
uh, you know, staying flexible in terms of your metabolism. And it's very important to be sure you can, can uh, walk both sides of that, that you can deal with excess growth hormone if you have some at the moment after a nice workout and a good meal. Um, and that also you can deal with the uh, 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 famines that come along, either on purpose with fasting or not, and that you can prevent uh, Alzheimer's and those kinds of things. So I think it's, very, it's a great question. I don't have all the answers. No one does. But it's a, you know, something we should keep asking and, and thinking about. I love it. So let's give her a big round of applause for a great talk. <laughs>